It is our purpose today to try to continue our discussion of several descriptive terms that are used in the inspired writings of the apostles and prophets of Christ to try to explain and magnify various points and characteristics of what takes place in the life of an individual when they are, and again I'll have to use some of the descriptive terms, saved, uh, redeemed, which is the last subject we were, uh, last term we were discussing. Uh, there's many, many more of them, and we're hopefully going to come to a new one just in a few moments in this tape. But I want to uh, call to your attention a point or two that we didn't have time to put on the last tape when we were discussing the matter of the apostles and prophets of Christ describing the redemption that takes place when one becomes a child of God. Uh, I had never thought about it uh, until I started making the tapes on this series and using these different descriptive terms. And uh, this is the second or third time when I've tried to uh, speak of what would take what takes place in the life of an individual. And then every time I try to uh, say what it is, then I have to use one of these descriptive terms. So that's very interesting. We're right now, as I said, discussing the point, the term redemption, or being redeemed. And we dealt with that in the last tape, but I want to bring to your attention that in some of the writings that we have, some of these letters that were written to Christian people, there is a redemption that has already taken place in their lives. They have already been redeemed. But yet, amazingly, the writers speak of a redemption yet to come for those who had already been redeemed. Very strange. In, in one sense of the word. But it goes back to what we were talking about a long time ago in another tape, how that people who were already saved were spoken of as being in the process of a continuing salvation and also uh, a salvation yet future for them in a sense. Let me call your attention to what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome uh, and by the way, I, I put this chart back up here because I thought it would be good to remind us of where we are on this timeline as we're having these discussions. We took this chart down a long time ago in our series and put up the chart of uh, Hebrews 9, 14 through 17 and where we magnified the cross and what took place there. Then we've talked about the resurrection of Christ, and then we've already been discussing at length, great length in fact, the, uh, part, the parts of the scripture that relate to the establishment of the church. Jesus had promised back here in Matthew 16, 18, when he said, uh, upon this rock, the ground bedrock, the foundation principle, which Peter had just con confessed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that foundation, Jesus promised to build his church. He said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Or I put probably would be better to say in Hades, the unseen realm of the dead. If I understand that correct, correctly, Jesus was saying he was going to lay his life down. He was going to his. He was going to go into the uh, realm of the the dead, the unseen realm of the dead. Be, his body would be buried, 
but then he was promised on the third day he'd be raised from the dead. And we've talked about that resurrection. And that they, the, the bars or the chains of death would not hold him and prevent him from establishing his church. He came back from the grave, and we've already talked about the commission he gave his apostles. We've read about Peter preaching the gospel as recorded in Acts chapter 2, which was about, I believe, if you count it up, 50 days after the death of Christ. What the Jewish calendar, the mosaic, under the mosaic system called Pentecost. All right, the main point for talking about this is we want you to understand that when we're reading these passages, we're talking about things that happened over here uh, 20, 30 uh, years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and the establishment of the church. The apostles and prophets of Christ have gone out into the world, and even individual Christians. Uh, who were scattered by persecution went everywhere preaching the word. And multitudes of people believed and obeyed the gospel, were thus then saved, uh, redeemed, uh, added to the family of God, and added to the church, by the way. And we've got to come to some, one of these days to talk more in detail about the scriptures and making reference to the church. But right now, let it suffice that we realize where we are chronologically, on this timeline, we're talking about events here when the uh, church has been established and now Paul has written this letter to the church in Rome. The church being that the assembly, the congregation, the total number of the disciples that were in the great city of Rome of that day, the capital of the world. Now, as he writes to them, he has these words to say in the letter as we have it divided for our convenience and easy reference. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18 through 25. I'll read, please, and invite you to follow. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until, uh, together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, but who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Now that's Romans chapter 8, verses 8 through 18 through 25. Now by the way, I have read that in your hearing from a translation of the scriptures called the New American Standard Translation. I have been reading to you some, a uh, great deal actually, I believe, uh, from the New King James translation, and I have also here the original King James. Uh, I like and uh, recommend to you, I believe I can say that sincerely, all three of these translations, and you can compare them in your reading. That's why I brought this one with me this morning, and... Uh, read from it. I may revert back to the King James here after a while because I've got a thumb, de th thumb index here on it and it's easier for me to keep up uh, or that is to find the places more quickly. But for the, hear the, for the reading we read in the hearing, Paul describes 
the present condition of those Roman Christians. They were suffering, as were most all other Christians of that time. They suffered persecutions. And uh, he's trying to help them to understand that uh, whatever they're going through with, whatever they're suffering, loss of property, uh, beatings, imprisonment, uh, and maybe even being killed, that that suffering was not to even be compared. It wasn't worthy to be compared with this glorious thing that was awaiting uh, for the, the Christian in the next life. And uh, then he says, that, as, as I understand it, that the whole physical creation, the heavens and the earth, have come into suffering and uh, groans, he says, and suffers the pains as a, a woman in childbirth because of the curse that was put on the earth when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, transgressed God's law, ate of the forbidden fruit, and uh, were put out of the garden. And God pronounced a curse upon the man, the woman, the serpent, or Satan, and also uh, the entire uh, earth, that it would bring forth uh, briars and thorns, and there'd be all kinds of problems uh, that we face every day in this life. And it was not, uh, uh, the, the, the creation, the physical creation did not make the choice. It was just put under that burden uh, and even the animals and things that we have in, in this world. But he describes this whole physical universe as waiting eagerly for the, the time when man uh, mankind, God's uh, creatures made in His image, will have a, a redemption that is yet future. Uh, I think I'll just leave my comments to that right there. I've got some more uh, opinions about that, but perhaps I better keep them to myself. Uh, you just study the text for yourself. It seems to me like he's saying there's a uh, redemption for the children of God yet future. Let's see what he had to say to the Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, let's see if I can uh, read that in your hearing. Starting the 7th verse, Ephesians 1, 7. Uh, here he is right here. Again now he's writing to uh, Christian people. It says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Now that they already had that redemption. They, they were already redeemed. The price had been paid by the blood of Jesus. Now let me compare the 14th verse here. It says, uh, well, I better back up and get another verse or two before that to give the full context. He tells in the 13th verse, it says, uh, in him that is in Christ, you also, the Ephesian Christians, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now we've talked in past tapes about how that they received the power of the Holy Spirit. They, they, it was tangible. They could feel, see, hear. The, there were miraculous evidences that they had this uh, power of, of, and the indwelling, the filling of the Holy Spirit, sometimes called the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, Paul says to them, uh, that this uh, He, the Holy Spirit, uh, is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now, I take that to, to, to mean he was saying to those Ephesians, those Ephesian Christians, 
that the fact that they had a miraculous working of the Holy Spirit in their lives and that they could they could speak in other languages that they had not studied or been born to, into, uh, they received direct revelations from God and uh, told them uh, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, to people who needed to learn these lessons. Uh, they were able to perform miracles such as healing the sick and even raising the dead by this miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, then Paul says, now you know you have that. And it's something that they, that, as I said, it was tangible. And Paul said to the Ephesian Christians, this is God's seal. It is a promise that he has, it is, a, it is something to verify that he will keep the promise that he has made to eventually redeem you from this whole cursed earth and all that is contained in it. Uh, I'll read that 14th verse again. Who is given us, uh, who is given as a pledge, that is the Holy Spirit was given to them as a pledge of their inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. So there's, as I said, they had already been redeemed, but there was also a time yet future when the final act would be done, the whole uh, process completed. And uh, for those who remain faithful, they would enjoy this everlasting redemption to the praise and the glory of God. Now, I, I, I think I'll, I'll go back to Romans chapter 7. I've got that in my notes here. Let's go back there just a minute. And then we're going to go on to a new descriptive term, uh, hopefully. Romans 7. And let's see, let's look about verse, start about verse 19. Let's see, Romans 7. All right, now, watch Paul's description of the struggle that existed in his own Christian life. And I always think of him a bit as being a mature Christian, and, and I think we could say he was, and he had the miraculous indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He had the, the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit given to him by God to enable him to do the work of an apostle. And the Holy Spirit spoke through him. Now listen to him describe his own, uh, as I said, uh, struggles in the Christian life. He says, uh, starting uh, chapter, uh, say Romans 7, chapter, uh, verse 21, I'm sorry. Romans 7, verse 21. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging a war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. He, even as a mature, mature child of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, had this daily struggle of his, his flesh, his physical body, having desires to do things that were wrong and things that he didn't want to do. And he looked forward to a time when he could be freed from that and no longer be under such stress and such struggle against the temptations of the flesh. So the child of God, uh, 
who has been redeemed by the blood of Christ, even yet looks forward to that day and time when the we will be redeemed from all of that struggle and that wonderful time and place where there will be no sorrow, no pain. God will wipe away all the tears and we'll be freed from that struggle of between the flesh and the spirit. Now, let's take up a new uh, term as I say. So many of them are used to describe what takes place in the life of an individual when they, as I said, are saved. And this time we're talking about the term freed. And Paul hinted at that in that last reading there in Romans 7, 24. He talked about being freed. Uh, we can describe it as being set at liberty. Um, I, I, I think this is one of the greatest terms. Uh, they're all wonderful, of course. But to me, there's just a... I guess I love my freedom. And we've been brought up in a... A, a culture and a, and a country where uh, freedom is valued very highly. And one of the most uh, horrible thoughts in, in my way of looking at it would to be in bondage, to come into slavery, to have to live under a dictatorship, and, and to be abused and mistreated so cruelly as so many people have been in past ages, and I hate to say, as so many people are in this very day uh, in bondage. So the, we have a great uh, feeling, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful thoughts when we hear this term being set at liberty or being free. And this is one of those great terms that is used to describe uh, the condition and, and the, the position of a child of God. And it talks about what Christ has done for us. Now there is a good way to describe it. Maybe I'll remember that. Uh, these are descriptive terms talking about and describing to us what Christ has done for us. That's good. Uh, we're going to begin reading now then concerning being freed in John 8, 33 through 36. Now, now this, here's an interesting point right here, I believe. Now, what I'm doing right now, see, I'm going, to, I'm going back here and I'm going to read to you something that Jesus said while he was yet on the earth uh, during his approximately three years of uh, teaching in the, the area where he was born. And uh, I'm going to read to you some things that were said between Jesus and the people of his day. Then in a few minutes we're going to jump back over here and start reading out of these letters now that were written by uh, inspired persons, apostles and prophets of Christ uh, and, and sent, these letters being sent to various groups and individuals of Christians. So don't forget, don't, don't lose that now. It's important to realize when you're back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, see, you're over here. Right? So I'm in John now. John 8, starting in verse 33. Uh, I, I, I just love John's record of the life of Christ. Uh, somehow it's special to me. And all the way through this, uh, the big deal of the whole thing is uh, who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Now I may have mentioned that before. So he's having, and he'd have discussions with these people. So here he's in the, in the midst of one of them in John 8 verse 33 beginning. They answered him. Uh, well I'm sorry, I should back up just a little bit and pick up uh, 32. Jesus had just said to those people, he said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, then these Jews 
Jewish people who were listening to him said, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? In other words, they said, hey, we're children of Abraham and we've never been in bondage to anybody. And how do you now stand up and say, if, if you listen to me, I'll tell you the truth, and I am the truth, and I can make you free. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Now there's, that's what we're going to be talking about in this discussion. We're just about to run out of time on this tape. But, these people actually were in bondage. They were in bondage to the Roman government, in fact, although they denied it here. But they say, we've, we've, we're free. And Jesus says, if you only understood that because you are sinners, because you and everyone else has committed sin, then you, be, you are in bondage to your own sin and sinfulness. And I'll read on just a few, uh, a little farther, uh, about to 36. And he goes on and said, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. They were, they were, uh, standing there listening to the one that could set them free from their sins and yet they say to him we've never been in bondage knowing not we're going to talk about that hopefully at great length knowing and understanding not that they were in bondage in slavery to their own sins now to continue reading on that same line of thought we'll get in just a little bit more here on this Romans 6, 16 through 23. Now, that, now we've gone over here, now we're reading one of these letters that Paul wrote. Again, we're back to his letter to the Romans. Romans 6, starting 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your member servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye now are ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants of God, ye love, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I think that will just about wind that tape up. We'll come back and take up our thoughts right there on that uh, reading, hopefully in the next tape.